Oh, well, I'll figure this out. Does that work? Did that work? Yeah. Yes, it did. So now I can see the gentleman behind us. Oh, Magnus. yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we see and hear you. Good. Magnus, how are you? Hello. Hello. So I've decided to take the tack on tonight to, to try and bring out the possibly positive things that COVID is doing for cities because I'm tired of moaning and groaning and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, I'm going to be positive as well. We'll see how that works. <laughs> Especially in America after after last night, I feel like we have to focus on something good. Yes. Oh my god, yes. The positive so here I, I, I gave some some um if you'll see on the PDF and in the email, just uh you know, some data points on just kinda you know, we do a lot of work with UN Habitat and, and a lot of this sort of regeneration kind of applies in, you know, sort of primary market, secondary market and tertiary markets and, and the evolution of that. So, you know, again, I think, I think what we could do is, as you saw, as I put here on the timeline and the tr structure is, you know, we could kind of, you know, depending on how you all feel, we could just kind of either go down this list if, uh, you know, we're not going to have enough time for all the questions, right? So the question <laughs> within the questions is, you know, kind of what direction here, um, what are the top three that we want to address or, um, you know, I mean, it's 45 minutes. So 45 minutes, if four people are speaking introductions for a couple of minutes and then the questions, which could be an answer could be two, three, four minutes, we might possibly get through two. Yeah, I'm flexible. Whatever you want to do, you're the, you're the moderator. Excellent. Good. Oh, love a flexible so, group. I don't. I don't see your face anymore, John. You don't. No. I see yours. <laughs> can Magnus? Can you see me? Yes, I can. Good. I'm in my kitchen in New York City. How come you? I don't see you on my on the screen anymore. Odd. Uh, Magnus, where are you located? I'm located in uh, Malmö in southern Sweden, uh, yeah. across the bridge from Copenhagen. Nice. Yeah. So my nice. dad's ancestors uh, come from Malmö. Okay. I've been, I've been there, so that's where my fa my dad's family came from. Okay. Know it well. I'm. It's three thirty in the morning, and I'm in my kitchen in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Huh. Drinking, drinking lots of coffee. So I hope we're having right. <laughs> staying wired. <laughs> well, I was afraid to go to sleep for sure. I wouldn't wake up. I oh, know. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hi, this is, this is Ben from uh, Simple Thing in Surrey. We had some technical problems, but uh, we arrived in time. <laughs> so, no. the best greetings from Germany. <laughs> greetings from uh, New York City. Yeah, great. I remember we met last year. Huh? Yes, sir. How are you? Uh, oh, excellent. Uh, uh, so you know, uh, in local local council, we uh, normally we don't have any problems. Yeah, we have enough uh, enough budget and <laughs> all, all the topics uh, we are we are dealing with. Yeah. So we have a big finance crisis at the moment. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's, uh, everything is okay. They haven't let me in our in our council chambers since March. We've had to have every meeting uh, by Zoom. Okay, you had one, no? We, we have city council meetings at least once a week now. Uh, okay. Wow. But I haven't actually seen my colleagues in person since March. How oh, you do it only by Zoom, yeah? Okay. Yeah, only, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did it in an uh, in, uh, um, intensive crisis of Corona. We did the same with Zoom. We, took, we chose Zoom too. Uh, but we, uh, we started meeting again in uh, June. Uh, we started in, uh, even May, uh, we started meeting again in, in Personal meetings. 
Have you both actually been using Zoom or other platforms? Because I found that, that throughout this sort of evolution, a lot of people started leaving Zoom because of its lack of security. And I mean, we hosted an event and we, we literally got hacked. And uh, it'd be interesting to hear from both of you. Yeah, I forget. We, we, we've used two different platforms. We're on a, a new one now um, that's supposed to be more secure and also enables better uh, uh, interaction with staff. Yeah, we, uh, we, we didn't use it uh, before, but uh, we, we chose Zoom too. We had uh, another platform, I forgot the name, it was, was more, a more regional one, but which wasn't so comfortable. Uh, so uh, um, because of all the possibilities of Zoom, uh, we've been really satisfied. Uh, sure, we had all the discussion about data protection and how secure a system of Zoom is, uh, it was a worldwide discussion. Um, but I think it's the best system we, we, we had, and so, so we still use it today if we, we need to do some, some conference. I'm, um, um, I, I'm, I'm uh, additionally active in the Council of Europe, I think uh, I told you last year, and we use different platforms. Uh, Council of Europe has their own platform, Kudo. You can make all the, um, all the translation and uh, all the... the the decisions uh, by the system and use blue jeans and uh, different platforms. So a lot of yeah. platforms. Yeah, too many. <laughs> I actually had a meeting this morning with a company from Slovakia, uh, and we're, we're uh, I'm helping them. I'm being their their test city uh, as they're developing a, a communications platform uh, between the government and the local city. So it's. Uh, it's interesting to, to have something being developed around our needs, uh, at least on a test case that we can build. But I agree. It's a, it's a new platform between local level and, and government. Yeah, it's, it aggregates all of our information on zoning and planning and permits and uh, feedback when a street light goes out and uh, us being able to push information as well oh, as wow. facilitate information from them. We can even have a link to the local online newspaper um, so that it provides uh, a, a more core place to get all information about the city and share information about the city rather than having it disparate in different places. Great. That's so phenomenal. it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where we're going. That's the future of smart cities. It's just basically being able to have it all in one uh location physically and be able to have that dashboard well what's interesting is as i've i've kind of put it out there in other speeches that i've given saying cities need to work with the startups when they're startups because oftentimes business don't really understand the pressures that we're under and, and the legal restrictions and everything else and yeah. we don't necessarily understand the, the development aspect and so you can you can get a much better product if you get involved earlier in the in the <coughs> development <coughs> Uh, help shape it. Yeah. So somebody somebody heard me say that, and and uh, there we go. Took you up on it. <laughs> yep. Great. What what time is it where you guys are? It's uh, in the morning. Uh, in the morning? No. What time? Yeah. Twelve thirty. Um, oh, we have for twelve twelve thirty. In Germany. The lunchtime panel for you guys. It's breakfast for yeah. us East Coast guys over here. Uh, yeah. no, no need for lunch. I had a really a very important duty in the morning. We opened a new shop of uh, chocolate here, very ex excellent chocolate here. <laughs> uh, nice. German, uh, German master. And uh, so I had to taste some chocolate in the morning. So that's enough for lunch. <laughs> so, that's, uh, so you don't need any coffee then? <laughs> All right, guys, I think, um, let's see, we have 6.30, my time. Um, I think what we'll do is what, this is live and it's streaming. So shall we wait one more minute, Get allow some people to, transfer rooms and uh, we shall get started. Sure, I'm gonna grab some coffee while we wait a minute. Perfect. Should we have the micro open or only if you give us, give us the floor?
so basically what I'm going to do is if, it, if you see from the, um, the, um, the sort of panel structure, well, I'll just give a, just a high level introduction and, and, um, and then what I'll do is I'll just jump into, you know, sort of the first question and with the first question, um, I'll ask all of you to just kind of spend, you know, 45 seconds, a little bit of background, um, or, or however long you want within. And ideally, I think we want to kind of flow with three, three minutes per question. And then I'll just sort of navigate to see how, how we're doing. I think, you know, ideally, just if you could be conscious of, of, of maintaining that, because with these digital platforms, it's not like you can, you know, um, you know, the only way, the only way to give you any, uh, uh, uh Time, timelines is to actually interrupt. So I just don't want to do that as it's being recorded. So, um, you know, and if we need more time, just let me know as, as, um, as you're in your, your uh, um, discussion. Sergio, do you see there's a message from Jean-Paul for you on the, in the chat box? I did not. How long? There are messages. Yes, I see that earlier. Yes, yes. Just says hello. Yes. Excellent. All right. I think, um, shall we get going? Yeah. We are missing, I'm just checking, we are missing a panelist. And um, I'll just give her another minute because she is on in Portugal, so it is not oversleeping. It's 1130 in Portugal right now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like your tie. What's on your tie? Are they, Where? are they little elephants? Oh, no, I wish, right? I wish I was more creative. Just, oh, no, that's, you're talking about the, uh, I think about Magnus. About Magnus' yeah. tie, yes. I was going to say, there's only two guys with ties. <laughs> yeah, flowers on the tie. Oh, they're flowers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I really wonder if ties will survive COVID-19. That's one of the casualty, wardrobe casualties <laughs> that I see coming out of the pandemic. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering, Sergio, we are, there are very few in the audience. There are only two people actually in the audience uh, at the moment. Yes. Let's see. I was just reading a McKinsey report on the... Uh, impact of COVID on the fashion industry. Ah, definitely. Definitely going to be, take a hit. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's moving into um, the circular economy. People are renting ball gowns now, and it's going to be yeah. interesting to see how it evolves. I think Lululemon have done well. <laughs> Working out. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Brooks Brothers have not, you know. Yeah. I mean, think about it, seven months of not having to, to, to buy anything new, right? And, and, and you got enough clothes, you got to wear it. And, and um, that's just, I mean, I, as, as, again, from a suit perspective, ties, right? Like, I, I personally think that, the, you know, it's, we're just going through a phase, but it's not going to change. But also, I just think that, you know, the, the, the suit market is definitely going to evolve and, and all the, well, you know, because these guys have to survive. We'll see who actually uh, makes it through. Yeah. Brooks Brothers is legendary. All right. I think that um, although I believe um, we have only three people, two people here, um, I do think that these things are streamed and recorded. So I do want to be respectful to Frank's agenda. And uh, and we are missing a panelist, um, and I think maybe she might not show up because she emailed me and said she was going to do a presentation about her business, and I said that this was the wrong setting, so she might not have been excited about my response. <laughs> I said there is a structure. All right, so um, let's just kick it off. Excellent. So welcome everyone to our session this morning at 6.30 New York time, 12.30 European Central time. 
we're moderating a panel that is focused on the regeneration and evolution of cities. Really, what is the, you know, where are cities going? Are we attracting innovators? We're attracting innovators, merchants, and tourists, but how are cities going to evolve in a post-COVID um, environment, right? Should we, are we looking at rebuilding? Is there any plan for, you know, taking examples of what we are looking at in so, sort of the conversation we were just having? What does that future look like in cities? What does the future look like in a, you know, post-COVID environment? And, um, you know, how are we going to tackle, you know, these issues? And, uh, and what are the examples that, you know, we can uh, learn from? And I think, uh, you know, we have two uh, mayor, existing mayor, current mayor, former mayor. And, um, you know, between here, I think we could have a really, you know, incredible conversation. So what I'd like to do is uh, start the moderating and stop talking. So with that, um, you know, Catherine, I'd love to lead with you. And, um, and basically, you know, please uh, first give us an intro. But the um, question is, we'll start with question number one. Cities grew to serve many, attracting innovators, merchants, tourists, a better life, right? How, how might our overgrown cities evolve? Are these cities evolving or are they, are they regenerating? And I think it'd be great hearing from, from both of you mayors specifically because of, you know, what you're seeing in this sort of transformation of uh, the new tomorrow, or is it the same yesterday? Mayor? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm a uh, former mayor of Menlo Park, uh, current city council member. I've been on council for eight years. In Silicon Valley, we have an interesting way. We rotate being mayor, so we, we each get to take turns uh, sticking our, our head up and answering all the, all the questions. And uh, previous to moving to Silicon Valley, I lived in England, and I lived for 11 years in Asia running tech companies. So I have a tech background as well as a, a government background. So that's kind of why I, that evolved into my interest in uh, smart cities and getting involved on that level. And, you know, when we look at COVID, look historically, and contagious diseases have generated urban transformation throughout history. I mean, that's, that's how people have, have moved around, and, and it's, it's nothing terribly new. So we have to look at, at the past sometimes to to be able to look forward to what we have in the future. And many people say that it will never return as before, you know, and, and I just can't accept that. I think that's hyperbole. What is happening, COVID is fast tracking the development and the adoption of many things that have been in the pipeline. It's, it's fast tracking our future, which will certainly feel like a new normal. Uh, but some changes weren't on anyone's radar before. And this is going to, re it's requiring cities and businesses to rethink their infrastructure, their staffing, their town centers, many aspects. Um, but it's not all bad news. And, and I wanted to focus today on uh, the good things that may come out of COVID because um, I think we do a lot of gnashing of teeth and we have to accept what it is. Uh, kind of like the Who Moved My Cheese book. You have to, uh, to start moving forward. Things like more flexible locations uh, for people to work often lead to happier workers. People are being able to call in from the Bahamas or from Tahoe uh, and work just as efficiently. And businesses are finding that uh, it works just as well in, in many cases. And fast tracking better delivery systems. Uh, the new dependence on delivery is pushing forward. Uh, we have robots, delivery robots that are little uh, things on wheels that will come out and deliver things to you in the communities, drones, uh, better logistics, improved traffic, not only with, with not as many cars on the road with people not commuting back and forth, but um, it's encouraging people to e-bike instead of taking a bus, healthier uh, solutions, and uh, a lot of the, the normal CIP funds that the city would have are being able to be re uh, repositioned to develop infrastructure for greener, healthier transportation modalities like e-bikes, uh, prepare more quickly for autonomous vehicles and programs with more positive impacts for, for the residents. And COVID is also um, helping the smart city solutions, but we can, we can talk more about that, I think, uh, with the next question you have. Excellent, excellent. thank you so much, um, Mayor. And uh, Lord Mayor, please, can you, same question? 
Yeah, thank you, thank you, Sergio. Hello, everybody. So, thank you for the invitation to this panel. It's it's good to meet in a format like uh, this. It would be better personally, but nevertheless, it's a uh, very good to, to have the uh, conferencing because uh, I think it's important to to discuss about the future. Yeah? What are the lessons learned uh, after um, or during all the, the COVID uh, topic? And there are a lot of transformation processes going on on the local level, and we see some some changes uh, around um, COVID. Just some words um, to concerning my city. Um, I'm the mayor of Simmelfingen. It's a medium-sized town, about 60,000 inhabitants uh, in the southwest of Germany, um, in the region of Stuttgart. It's a very automobile industry, the automobile heart uh, of, of Germany. And we have the biggest plant of Mercedes in, in my city with about 37,000 employees. And so we are very close to all the, the developments of um, uh, the, the automobile uh, industry. And um, we see a lot of changes. Uh, we even saw a lot of changes uh, before COVID. Uh, we had a lot of discussions uh, last year already concerning uh, the transformation in, in automobile industry, the local developments in climate change, uh, e-mobility, all the different uh, new uh, forms of mobility. So there are a lot of, of changes uh, going on on a, on a local on a local level. We are working uh, on, um, on climate change projects in the city, digitalization, and, and many more. And uh, sure, um, as you already heard, uh, um, if you look at uh, the, the COVID crisis, uh, we see uh, see that, that some things are going faster. Uh, if you look at digitalization, uh, video conferencing like this, uh, but we see it. Uh, we see it uh, in the companies. Um, the, it was a challenge for everybody. Um, everybody thought we have uh, enough digitalization in our schools. Yeah, if you, if you look in reality, uh, there was still some work uh, to do. Yeah, and so we we, we made a lot of effort um, to um, to become better, yeah, serving our schools, serving the children, yeah, to to work with digital products uh, to have a chance to to learn. Yeah, of course, we, we stopped all these activities uh, concerning uh, being present in the school. So we we made it uh, with, with digital. Uh, methods. So there are a lot of things going on, a lot of transformation processes. Um, just perhaps to to put one point, um, we have one very interesting project uh, all over the region. It's called the uh, International Building Exhibition uh, in the year 2027. Some people know the region of Stuttgart. We had it 100 years ago. Yeah, in 1927, it was very famous, a very famous uh, architectural activities in Stuttgart. And the next one is planned for uh, 2027. And uh, cities like ours, we are working on this project. Yeah, so we are looking in, in different in districts to develop new districts. And uh, the central question of this uh, international building exhibition is, how do we, we live in the 21st century together with smart living, with housing, housing working together, to bring things a little bit more together. And uh, that's really one, one of the decisive questions in our area. How could we organize future with a mixture between digitalization, but uh, with, with, with uh, future visits, uh, which is built? Yeah? So we are planning to build new areas, new districts, and uh, to implement all the, the discussions we have, uh, how we should uh, do this uh, in future. So that's very, one, very one interesting points in our area at the moment. Thank, thank, you. So, thank, thank, thank you so much, Lord Mayor. Uh, Magnus, I um, think it'd be great now, kind of having heard two public officials speak about it. I'd love to hear from your perspective and, and your background as well, and please introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Magnus. I'm uh, uh, working on resilience, uh, urban resilience, and have been doing so for the last uh, 10 years. Um, so, so my take on this is that we have now, during the, the pandemic situation, uh, felt the, the issues about having large cities and condensed cities. If, if I look at it from my perspective, it seems that the most uh, severe situations uh, has occurred around bigger cities, uh, at least here in, in the northern part of the euro. So for, for me, uh, this, uh, this reaction to the pandemic has really shown that we kind of uh, turned down our cities uh, via the lock-in situation and uh, um, that generate the uh, financial and economical situations that we have ahead of us and basically 
cities uh, have in some way stopped functioning. Kids cannot go to school. The elderly people cannot have visitors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so I think uh, to basically to, to uh, attach to to the the question here about uh, are we uh, evolving or uh, uh, are we uh, kind of uh, uh, regenerating cities? I think there has been a trend of both uh, before the COVID. We are both evolving and regenerating. We are cities are growing and we are building more more buildings. Uh, if we are not doing it wisely, we, we're having the problems that we have in Europe with the Win Million Homes program. We have big uh, city districts where people only live and there is no reason for, for anyone to go there. However, uh, if we were uh, regenerating our cities wisely, we start to, to uh, create a blend. And there are some cities that have a strategy of, of creating the 20-minute cities where you can live your life or you can basically live your daily life at least within 20 minutes in, in, the, in the bigger city. Uh, and I think that is, is uh, very uh, positive. There is also another thing happening at the moment, uh, which I think uh, opens up for opportunities. And that is that I see more cities and more regions talking about the future exploratory scenarios and adapting them to, to, to future strategies as well. Uh, before, there was a lot about prognosis. Uh, cities are making prognosis for growth, how many people will move into the cities, and trying to make decisions about that. Uh, and the only thing we know about prognosis is that they are always wrong. So, so I think the, the whole idea of using scenarios, trying to, to imagine what the future will be like is, is uh, something that is quite useful, especially in this situation where we need to, to kind of uh, create uh, new ways uh, of uh, using public transportations in cities, uh, maybe rethink uh, how we uh, crowd ourselves in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the cities for the future, not only for this, this uh, pandemic, but also for the future. So that's a, a quick angle, but basically my perspective is that uh, we start to think about the functionality of cities, uh, and how we can maintain that functionality when under pressure, whether it's acute shocks or uh, chronic stresses is uh, important. And we made an analysis uh, here in, in uh, the Nordics of a uh, few cities and found out that the functionality is to 85% depending on the private sector, on the companies, uh, and only 15% on the local governments. That meaning public, private, collaboration is even more uh, important for the future. And we need to bring in those uh, companies operating cities uh, and start thinking about functionality, how they connect uh, the interdependencies in the, in the whole urban flow system. Magus, yes, thank, th thank you so much. And actually you brought up something really interesting, something I'm, I'm definitely personally very passionate about is PPPs and public-private partnerships and multi-stakeholder governance. and. And as, as um, you know, Mayor Carlton also mentioned earlier about, you know, how, you know, trying to educate private sector companies on how to engage the public sector. You know, we, we did a session with a Global Compact around, you know, public-private partnerships and the future of governance and government in a post-COVID environment. And, um, you know, that really touches on that. And that's really exciting. Thank you, um, you know, for bringing that up um, this early in the conversation, because that itself could go into a tangent. Um, the, uh, John, the floor is yours. I think, uh, you know, it'd be great to hear from your perspective, your experience and what you are seeing and some of the stuff that, um, you know, our, our Cadis is, is, uh, in, in sort of, uh, engaging and, um, and now kind of having heard from all perspectives, uh, please introduce yourself and, uh, lead us into your. Okay. Well, good morning from New York city. Uh, I'm on the Upper East side and you're down downtown in Tribeca. Uh, I work for Arcadis, which is a uh, Dutch sustainability consultancy, um, so a private sector. I lead our Global Cities program. We focus on three things. We focus on urban uh, mobility, urban regeneration, and urban resilience. So those are the primary areas. And uh, the portfolio of my team and program is 21 cities globally, of which New York 
in San Francisco are, are two of them. Uh, Malmo, not yet, uh, uh, but who knows, maybe in the future. Well, you know, when I look at the question, how might overgrown cities evolve? I agree with every one of the panelists' perspectives. I, and I especially agree with Catherine's point of view that I think COVID-19 has accelerated a number of urban trends that were already existing pre-COVID, right? Particularly in the space of mobility, right? So, so you know, Magnus just talked about the 20-minute commuting city or the we call it the 15 minute city. This is really how New York City was created around various neighborhoods. And you would meet people who lived in the East Village who never left the East Village, had never been to Brooklyn or the Bronx. And I think we're gonna to return to that way of living now that we can work smartly and remotely. Catherine, I think the, the day of the, the tech buses running up and down the peninsula between you know the city of San Francisco and Sunnyvale and Menlo Park and Mountain, uh, Dale, I think those days are going to be really behind us. I don't think we need that ebb and flow, or as Magnus, you called it, the 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 flow, the urban flow, the pulsing of cities. I think is gone. I really think, and that's a good thing. We're going to have less air pollution, less congestion, less uh, impact, and we're going to go more and more. To Catherine's point around micro mobility and local mobility and e the e grids are going to really flourish and I think I think for the Lord Mayor in, in Stuttgart area that's a good thing I think the acceleration of the assembly line to the automobile from the internal combustion engine to the to an e uh, chassis and an e uh, uh, power powertrain is going to happen much more quickly so I think things that were already in place pre-COVID will accelerate. We'll see autonomous vehicles faster and sooner in our cities. We'll live in more concentrated areas, commute less in a pulsing long distance way. And a lot of positive good things will come in the evolution and the way cities manage the capacity to live in a city. And that, you know, that challenge around growth, overcrowding, congestion, air pollution, et cetera. I do think one of the big challenges that Catherine mentioned is e-commerce delivery. The last mile, so much of what we're doing now is purchased online. Uh, it's certainly, it, it's, it's troubling in two ways. It really puts pressure on bricks and mortar businesses and it really puts challenge in double parking and congestion and last mile delivery, particularly uh, in our city in New York. So that's my introductory comments. Thank you so much, John. And I think, the, you know, it, it's really interesting listening to all of your feedbacks because I think it's kind of like, you know, as, as, as the panel talks about evolving or regenerating, you know, it, it really is both, right? Because we are evolving and regenerating. And, and I think what's really exciting is exactly, John, as, as you said it, and I'm seeing it just here in New York where, you know, the sort of micro community of Tribeca, everybody knows everybody. Everybody right. is in their little neighborhood the same restaurants, but also what's really exciting is I think that, you know, we, uh, we have realized that we could live with so many things that we thought we couldn't live without. And, you know, and I think from a municipal city and local community setting, you know, this sort of getting back to community, um, you know, is, is really, you know, present and, and servicing the people. So, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's really exciting to, to, to hear all of you kind of, you know, address both of them, you know, of both topics, you know, evolving and regenerating. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the next question, and it looks like we're flowing perfectly here. Um, Post COVID, we are fearful of overcrowding. So should we rebuild nearby according to some grand open plan? Is any, you know, is there, is, is any plan sustainable for global innovation? And I mean, I feel like we've sort of, you know, really address this in the last question, but I'd love to, you know, hear, and Mark, Magnus, why don't we start with you? I have one reflection, uh, and we're, we're talking here in the Scandinavians and the Nordics about a new green wave. The last one we had was during the 70s, where people were actually moving out of cities into, into the greenery. Today, we now see a movement where the greenery is moving into cities. And if I look around the world, I can see also that that, that seems to be a way of, of uh, planning cities for the future. 
and make them more livable and more pleasant, but also more sustainable and more resilient. So, so that is, is quite a trend. And I think that also uh, indicates that we will most likely keep on living in cities. Uh, I don't think that that will be, even though th there has been some, some research in, uh, pinpointing that in some places we, we see the, the old way of, of the green way where people are moving out. But uh, in general, I think the, our cities will still be very attractive to live in and become even more attractive when it comes to, to uh, making them greener and more livable. On the other hand, there is a new technology emerging, uh, and that is the autonomous cars and the autonomous mobility. That means all of a sudden commuting to work is no longer an, an issue that is a, is a waste of time. It actually might be a very useful time for the future, which indicates that, again, living outside cities and having a smart community is attractive. And if we combine these two trends, we will see how this uh, uh, metropolitan area will grow in two ways, both inside the cities, but also the, the close uh, suburbans will also attract people. And, and uh, that might be that, in, in our case, we will see uh, taller buildings in the suburban areas, and we will have a new mobility systems. Uh, in place in the future based on, on uh, autonomous, electric, and uh, sharing economy. Thank you, Magnus. And I see that we have uh, Maria Elena just joined. And um, um, well, welcome. And uh, basically, we are on, if you look at your uh, um, PDF, we're on question number two. So I will give you the floor. Basically, we, the question is, post-COVID, are we fearful of overcrowding? You know, so we should should we completely rebuild, you know, nearby according to some grand open plan? Is there any sustainable or for global innovation, right? So, and global imitation, excuse me. But I know that you're working in a smart city space. You haven't had a chance to introduce yourself. So spend a minute, just a little bit on your background. And I know you're working on a on a, a smart city project. So this is a perfect question um, to land right into. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I had a problem joining you. They are, were asking for my profile and I, I, I couldn't uh, insert it. Anyhow, better late than ever. Uh, just to, to introduce myself, my name is uh, Marina Mipuri. I am the, the founder and president of Hera, the Light of Women. Uh, Harry is a new way of female empowerment and the umbrella of all who care for a better world and the future of humanity. I started this movement 20 years ago in the beginning of 2000 and in 2018 I have decided to actualize the principles of Hera into a physical city, Hera City. So uh, we, are, we have a project of building a smart green city for the future of humanity and with women leading the mission. This is a very new concept, a very new project that is attracting the attention of the governments and the, of countries. And we, have, we are dealing with already with some countries like France, Morocco, India and Panama uh, that want to welcome uh, Hera City. Uh, so it is very interesting for me to be part of this panel because we are talking about cities and how they should evolve or, or regenerate. So asking uh, your question, I would say that uh, always in the, the history of uh, mankind, we had a, a, a disaster when grand plans were conceived. So I think what it is, is important is to keep a strong local constitution, local issues, strong uh, uh, individual freedom, and of course, a state of law. Why? Because uh, if uh, these uh, essential things are not, uh, these essential elements uh, are not uh, uh, observed, it is going to be a disaster, okay? So uh, those elements without technology is decadence, but uh, uh, those elements without, uh, with technology is a, is a disaster. So talking about the, the the, if it is possible to, to have a, a city that can be um, that can be an example 
for the, the um, or can be imitated. With that, I think that this was the question because I am a little bit late. I am lost, <laughs> but I, but I think this this was this was your question. So I think that in terms of the the city that I am projecting and conceiving. I'm talking with United Nations city and they are wanting to use it as a template for the, 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 um, the, the cities going forward. So uh, I think that is, uh, that is a, a new uh, vision on how we can evolve uh, as a smart city and how we can use the technology uh, for the human being to serve the interest of the human being and not just to 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 get the privacy and the the data that uh, the human being can give to the to the local uh, power in the city. So uh, I could speak about the the example of my city, but I don't want to. I know this panel is go, is to, to talk about the problem of the cities in not about my narrow city. But uh, uh, I think that our project is an example of what can be done in the future for a better future for humanity and how we can conceive a smart green city serving humanity and not taking the, the freedom that humanity is, is allowed to have. Thank you so much. And th thank you, uh, Maria Elena. Just um, your, your reference to questions in, in the PDF, so don't worry, uh, um, we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll catch right up. Uh, Mayor Carlton, so can you uh, 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 sort of dive into the question? If you, let me know if you want me to repeat it. Or sure. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. Magnus talked about um, that uh, predictions are, are rarely, if ever, correct, which is true. But I, I love the quote that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And, and that's, that's the onus that's on us as leaders, whether we're leaders in business or whether we're, we're leaders of, of cities and municipalities. And we have to find a way of uh, basically providing these services as people are working more distantly. And again, look at the past to see what's happening in the future. Uh, an interesting example is uh, there's a Chinese development company called CFLD, and they started building uh, little micro cities around Beijing because Beijing is, is so large and the traffic was, was prohibitive to get work done. And uh, you're seeing that a lot in American cities where you have mixed use developments, uh, usually around the, the city center. And so you're seeing where people have, just like you have in New York, you have the, the, the different verbs, the different uh, mixed use developments, whatever, whatever you call them, depending on, on the size. And then people do come into the city. The cities still are relevant uh, to go to the opera. You go into the city to, to meet up with people and socialize with people from, from maybe other areas. And so you have to start rethinking, how are we going to uh, better design uh, the city centers to, to be able to, to meet these? And citizens, for example, don't have to go to the town hall for services. They can go... Um, uh, they can go online and use the services quite easily. And, and the services that I'm seeing evolving more aren't just for the city, they're, they're system solutions. And that really ties in with the, what people call the fourth industrial revolution, which is where we're no longer just looking at, at data systems or, or standalone things. We're looking at, we're moving into the, the systems age. Uh, things that I do in my city will impact the city next to me. Uh, our major issues are traffic, affordable housing, the things that a lot of the cities uh, struggle with, and the regional issues. So as we work together for these solutions as a city, we have to remember that we have to start working together. You're talking about public-private partnerships, and I, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, as we have more, more open data that enables people and businesses to, to better understand what the needs are, what the restrictions are that cities have. We can get involved with the tech companies earlier to, to better de evolve uh, better solutions for us to use. But we also have to remember that we're not living in a standalone world. We have to start thinking more on a systems level so that we're finding uh, uh, basically solutions that can scale and work together. 
That's a per- perfect segue as, uh, um, you know, it's going to, you know, I, I'm a huge believer in a smart city space that there is no imitation. There's no copy paste because everything is local, right? Because everything is based on the local community. But, you know, I think, John, this kind of, you know, lands right on your lap. 21 cities, you're, you're doing a lot of this work. You're working with major cities, smaller cities, global cities. Um, you know, can you please uh, provide your comments? Yeah, I'll give a plug to my podcast, which was just uh, published by London First today. Um, so if you can go to Twitter at London underscore first, you'll hear the podcast around space making. And it, it really speaks to the question, will our cities become overcrowded and will we better manage the crowds in cities? But as Magna said, you know, some people are putting the death nail on cities, which is absolutely crazy, false. It's not going to happen. Cities will rebirth, re- rebirth, and one of the areas that we're seeing cities rebirth, and we're experiencing it firsthand in New York, is space. All of a sudden, our restaurants are on the streets. They're, they're taking over parking spaces. Um, that's not going to go away. And, and, and in London and Brussels and Paris, they're taking over lanes, and they're devoting them to active transport, bike lanes. Those lanes are not going to go back to cars, right? And, and we're going to have outdoor dining going forward in, in, in the continuum of, of, of cities. This is a very positive outcome of COVID-19, and it reclaims a lot of lost space in our cities in, in devoted to cars. We probably have more infrastructure devoted for automobiles and trucks than we do to housing. This will free up a lot of that space. Surely the coveted parking space in New York City and San Francisco will become more and more difficult to find. It will displace cars away from the city, but that's okay. We have car sharing. We have other forms of transport, and we will occupy the sidewalks and we'll occupy the curbside. This will create some revenue challenges because many cities rely on curbside revenues, but they'll find hopefully revenues, as as Catherine said, through to really looking at the the business model of last mile delivery for e-commerce. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. I think space is the new place. Space making creates new opportunities and cities will continue to find ways to take mm-hmm. space away from transport uh, uh, roads and, and apply it to the citizen and the pedestrian. The examples we have, I gave you dining, there's pedestrian space and wall, uh, malls and walkways now. There's active transport space I gave you, there's performance space <clears throat> built up in cities now. So there's a lot of new movement, pre-COVID not even thought about, of releasing the opportunities in our city spaces. Thank, thank you so much, John. And, and uh, Lord Mayor, this, um, th- this is now, gives you an opportunity, having heard everyone, and, and you know, I'd love to hear your experience um, you know, as, as, as you're looking at this as well. Yeah, we are in an area where we have a lot of uh, pressure on, on the housing market. Many people want to move in our area because we are still a very prosperous region. Uh, so if you look at the question how, how to, to cope with the problem, I think it's not a good idea to rebuild completely new cities. I think it's important to develop the cities, yeah, to just put the points I already hear that, yeah. To, to look at the Greenway, yeah, we learned a lot of the Nordic states, uh, as I heard from Agnes, yeah, um, or from John, yeah, looking at space at the moment. Uh, by the way, we have a process in our city center, uh, how, how to develop the future of our city center, uh, to, to have just this discussion, where's the space, the space for pedestrians, uh, space for outdoor dining, or space for, should be our automobile city, yeah. A little bit, uh, uh, what about uh, the relation between cars, uh, motorways, uh, outdoor dining, pedestrians, public spaces, that's what just a discussion uh, we started. Uh, I think it could be a very interesting discussion. Yeah? I think not everybody would agree uh, directly. So it could be a very interesting democratic uh, discussion. But uh, I think uh, generally, I think it's important to, to develop the cities, to look at the community, yeah? to look at the community. We invested a lot, a lot of, of money and effort in even in the micro communities and the neighborhoods. Yeah. So that uh, people in big uh, apartment buildings, they meet again. We, 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 we developed uh, uh, areas where they can meet, uh, meeting centers. Uh, we, have, uh, we have people and staff uh, who occupy 
uh, for these different uh, things, uh, that they have activities, joint activities, so that we build up the neighborships. And I think that's uh, that's a chance of the existing cities to develop these these points. <clears throat> and even if you look at uh, back at the question of space, uh, that John arised, uh, even space discussion is one of these points. So that cities have a heart, that there is some identity, that people meet at the new spaces, perhaps we we deliver. And so I think that's that's a big uh, chance of, uh, of of the cities uh, to develop uh, organically, uh, to to create new spaces, to create new meeting points, so that the community meets, and that we, we can. And if we, even if, if you look at all these these challenges, time, COVID, all the challenges in, in development, in industry, uh, digitalization, everything. But I think it's important uh, on the other side to have a stable community. Yeah, and I think that's that's that gives some uh, some stability yeah, for people, some orientation, and I think that's one point we should uh, continue working on. Thank you. Um, I am not sure what happens in two minutes and forty five seconds, forty four, forty three, forty two, but I don't know if you all see the same thing that I'm seeing, and. Um, but I am not sure. But uh, I, I think what I'd like to do is kind of. It says go over. time is up in two it, minutes and thirty three seconds. No, I know. I don't know if it just cuts us off or not. But I saw other panel sessions go over. So I, I think uh, one of the things that I want to do is kind of go around and 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 have some you know each one of you kind of provide a minute, a minute and a half of your sort of your recap of you know kind of you know where do you see you know sort of this future uh, in community cities. And obviously, recapping the uh, two questions that we were able to uh, to to address, and um, and we will start with you, John. Okay. Well, um, I I think the opportunities coming out of COVID nineteen exceed the 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 pain points and the and the and the, the challenges. Clearly, as the Lord Mayor said. You know, we've got some revenue challenges in cities. Uh, they they will persist for a year or two. I think we'll we'll resolve those with new creativity. So many times, people told New York was dead. Right uh, after you know the Hurricane Sandy, people are going to leave New York. After 9/11, people are going to leave New York. After the Great Recession, people are going to leave New York, and that drum beat is again. And I think New York will re re rebirth itself in a more creative way. And I think space is really one of those brand new opportunities to take over the city. So I think cities are have a strong future ahead of them. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Magnus, can you um, give us your uh, 90 seconds? <laughs> yes, uh, I, think, I think what we have seen during the last uh, five years at least is that cities are turning their uh, heads towards other cities and looking for, for um, uh, partnerships within uh, different organizations such as uh, ICLE, 100 Resilient Cities, uh, now Global Resilient Cities Network, UN Habitat is having city programs, UNDRR, uh, uh, Nordic Cities, etc. etc. And that is because when cities are turning to the national government, they are turning their head towards a very silo organized structure where you need to dive into different uh, uh, government agencies that are specialists in transport or food or health or, or whatever. And they have the lack of holistic approach. So I think the, the reason cities are, are looking at other cities is where, because that's where they can have this holistic discussion and discussion about uh, uh, interdependencies within the cities and cities, and exchange best practice, new ideas, and learning. And that's where I see, see companies as, as uh, Arcadis and another large uh, uh, consultant firm so having this approach uh, very meaningful to collaborate with as well, because they are, are, are some way uh, provided for this. So, so again, public-private partnerships, cities to cities, the the network creating those. Uh, the connections will become even more important in, in the future because we need a holistic approach and the silos with the uh, quick fixes and low hanging fruits uh, they have already been picked excellent thank you magnus maria elena yes your, your uh, yes i i'm lucky because i am projecting a city from scratch 
So all the solutions are perfect because they are all studied uh, and we are uh, uh, making the perfect city that could serve as a template. But of course, if you have to adapt the smart uh, solutions to the existing cities, sometimes it's, it's not easy because there are always interests that have to be observed. And usually uh, the public uh, always thinks about the money uh, before they think about the, the, the well-being of the, the, the citizens. So uh, I, as I said, I am very lucky. But I would say to add to, to the existing uh, communities uh, that there are solutions. For example, uh, there is lots of poverty in the cities. And sometimes people forget it because uh, uh, you tend to think that uh, poverty is, is not so 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 present in the city than, than, than it is in, in, in other places. So I would ask that uh, we should observe some, some uh, community gardens with vegetables and fruits to combat hunger. And hunger is present and with COVID even more patent. So I think this would be something that we should think of to create community gardens that would bring more biodiversity and less carbon to the cities. This is already a, a principle that we should observe. Thank you so much, uh, Lord Mayor. Yeah, I think uh, we, we have seen uh, that, uh, that cities manage the crisis. We are still uh, working uh, on the crisis, and, uh, and um, I'm convinced cities did a, did a good job. Yeah, and uh, so I think it's very important that in future we have strong cities. Uh, it's a point we are a little bit concerned about. If you look on the Council of Europe, at the whole the whole picture of Europe, yeah, there are some, some uh, the, the developments of centralization. But I think we need strong strong cities to be resilient yeah, and uh, on a local level. Yeah, you have a chance. You have a very short way, short uh, ways to to decide, yeah, and you can be very fast uh, if you have a crisis like this. And I think we, we saw this uh, in our area, and I think there are many areas you, you, you can, can see the same. So, um, but if you look at a crisis, I think uh, I fully agree, and learned it in the panel too. Yeah, it could be it's an opportunity too. Yeah, if you look at the COVID crisis, uh, all the acceleration we discussed about in, in digitalization and smart city. Uh, um, and we see it in my city, we are a medium-sized city, but we see all the developments on an average scale, uh, uh, like like the big cities. And so I think that's very interesting. I think we will see a, really a change of cities, and I think cities will become greener, they will become uh, more digital, more flexible. And I think uh, if you look at the last discussion about spaces and all these discussions, uh, there will be more people-oriented, uh, Back, back to people a little bit more. Yeah. And I think that's a very good perspective. I'm happy about this. <laughs> thank you for that, Lord Mayor. And I think the, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as we wrap it up with uh, you know, former Mayor Carlton, I think, you know, one of the exciting parts, I think, from a perspective of somebody having been in the smart city space for over a decade is that, you know, the sort of digitization and actually getting back to humans because right, we've gotten so far where everyone is looking at tech is going to replace. It's not. You need people-centric smart cities and digital cities and, and, and focused on the environment, the economic development. And, you know, listening to, to all of you, I, I think it's really exciting. But now kind of wrapping up and, 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 you know, with you, former Mayor Carlton, I think, you know, one of the things that you said earlier, um, you know, where you are as a council member now, um, looking at sort of dashboard-based technologies that are totally inclusive as opposed to before operating multi-verticals. Uh, uh, and, and this was sort of a byproduct that's forced you into this direction because of, of the pandemic. Um, you know, can you please also give us your sort of recap and, and close us out? Sure. Um, I was just reading actually a McKinsey report and they were talking about the fact that a lot of the things that we were afraid of taking away people's jobs are actually enhancing people's jobs and freeing them up uh, to do more fulfilling work. Uh, so it's interesting to see how that evolves. And as we talk about crisis, you have to remember in, in Chinese crisis, the characters are danger and opportunity. And we have to keep that in mind that in every crisis we have an opportunity. And the one thing that we haven't talked about which you, we've, we've danced around a little bit, is the, the issues of, of equity and inclusivity with regard to, to COVID and cities. 
And COVID is ushering in a circular economy. We talk a lot about that, but this is being speeded uh, into, into our realities. It's now cooler to recycle and upcycle, which is better for the environment. It's better for waste management issues with landfills filling up. And it provides better equity inclusion for all the residents. Telemedicine. Uh, I myself was, was forced to use telemedicine, and I wasn't happy about it, but it was great. I was so surprised. I'll do it again. Uh, it's pushing us out of our comfort zones with these things. And telemedicine is much better for the elderly, for the people with mobility issues, the people who live far away, definitely providing better inclusion and, and support for, for our residents. And education. So much is now available online, whether we like it or not. Uh, for uh, adults, a lot of universities are now providing uh, free classes online so that it's available for people who might not have been able to afford it or might not have been able to travel there. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, my children are having to zoom into classes, uh, which is difficult uh, because even in the middle of Silicon Valley, sometimes the Wi-Fi isn't enough to handle five people in every house all trying to zoom in at the same time. So what this close I want to close with is on top of everything else, the city must support and better enable connectivity for all of our residents. As we have these fantastic new things that come online, as we bring in these smart city solutions and all this, we need to make sure that whether you're uh, rich or poor or what area of town you live in, you have the ability uh, to get online and to make use of these. Otherwise, we're pulling everything into an area uh, where it's it's not available and not accessible to a, a portion of our citizens, and that's not acceptable. Well, thank you so much. And, and, and uh, basically, I want to first and foremost thank all of you. I know we are straddling about one, two, three, four, five time zones. So it's exciting to just see how technology, as, as uh, former mayor just said, is, is, is really it's so important now in a post-COVID environment. And I think, you know, connectivity and access to connectivity is is a utility. It should be now, in essence, a human right for everyone, especially in, in situations such as this. It, it really shows that we can't let a pandemic or, you, you know, leave others behind just because they don't have access to information or education. Um, it also kind of, you know, brings it all, brings us all back to being human again. Um, you know, this is really exciting. There is a feature here that you will see. Uh, it's called a virtual group fee. Not a selfie, a group fee. So I am going to click this little thing. I don't know if I'm the only one that has this, but um, it says invite everybody, attendees as well, who's ever on here and start a group fee. So I'm pressing it. And I am, hold on. I think, do you all see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oops. I'm not going to retake it because I'm talking. <laughs> Is everybody done? What Let's do we see. do? Do we? It says go do we selfie. See no selfie. Yeah, yeah, and then and then use it. It says it. it oh, I see. I see. All right. Like a selfie. Yeah, it's like you're taking a selfie and then you're approving the picture. It gives you a chance to uh, oh, pick cool. your pick your best shot. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like a photo. Very right. cool. All right, so now I get to end group fee. This is all new. Confirm to end group fee. Hold on, because oh, it says everybody finished. 